Hello, and welcome to the unbounded potential of kimono, Kyoto to Catwalk. Over the next hour or so, we'll be joined by speakers, Anna Jackson of the VNA and designer Jotaro Saito, who will tell us about the enduring allure of the garment and explain to us the significance of it in modern fashion and society today. My name is Mark McAvoy of the Japan Information and Cultural Center, which is part of the Embassy of Japan in the UK. So a little bit about our speakers today. Um, Jotaro Saito was born into a family of Yuzen dyers. His grandfather established a business in Kyoto in the 1930s, and his father took a revolutionary approach to design, which have laid the foundations upon which Jotaro continues to build today. Since his debut as a kimono designer at the unusually early age of 27, his kimono brand has become one of the most well-known in Japan. His creations regularly appear at Tokyo Fashion Week, on television and across the media. He has succeeded in taking the kimono from its traditional context and changing it to reflect modern Japan. His flagship store is located in a very exclusive area of Ginza in Tokyo, but today he's joining us from his studio in Kyoto. A little bit later on, we will have the opportunity to have an in-depth look at his collection. Um, but first, we'll be joined by Anna Jackson. She is the keeper um, of the Asia Department at the Victoria and Albert Museum. She has written extensively on the subject of Japanese fashion and textiles, and also the cultural relationship between Asia and Europe. She is the creator, of course, of Kimono, Kyoto to Catwalk, which is Europe's first major exhibition of the kimono. Um, on the exhibition has more than 300 creations. Um, but unfortunately, this is the last week it is being shown in London. So on reflection, Anna, how do you feel? Mixed emotions? Yes, I'm very sad. I mean, obviously it opened at the end of February um, and we got loads of visitors, far more than we anticipated, and lots of good reviews. And then, of course, it closed three weeks later. So that was the really awful moment because I didn't know whether we'd ever be able to open again. But we did open at the end of August. So we have been open now for about nine weeks. Um, so people have been able to see it, although we're limited numbers, of course, because of the pandemic. But it will live on, and although we have to return some of our loans to Japan, uh, the exhibition will tour first to Gothenburg in Sweden, where it opens on the 12th of December. So it will, it will have an afterlife, which is always nice. It was so successful it survived the pandemic. So well <laughs> done. Congratulations. You. I believe you're going to explain a little bit about the exhibition to us. Yes, just let me share my screen. So yes, I was just going to talk a little, give a very quick introduction to the exhibition, perhaps for those who haven't been able to see it. As I'm sure some of you know, most of you know, perhaps the VNA is justly famed for its exhibitions on fashion, but inevitably these have been about, tend to have been about Western fashion and Western fashion designers. So we really wanted to show that fashion flourishes elsewhere in the world, notably uh, in Japan. But I think perhaps in the West, if people are thinking about fashion, the kimono is not the garment that comes to mind. We think of the kimono as being a, a timeless traditional costume. So really we wanted to counter that and really show that the kimono has a very dynamic fashion history. And also to show, despite the fact that we think of it as being quintessentially Japanese, it has also had a very strong impact on global fashion styles. And we signal these themes right at the beginning of our show with this beautiful kimono borrowed from Japan from about 1800, uh, with a design by John Galliano in the middle for his seminal collection for uh, Christian Dior in 2007, and by this fabulous contemporary piece made especially for us by, of course, Jotaro Saito. The exhibition opens in the Edo period, so the period from the from the beginning of the 17th century through to the mid 19th century. And it was at this point that a really uh, uh, thriving fashion culture emerged. And we start by looking at how kimono were designed, how they were created, uh, how you shopped for a kimono, and really the amazing uh, textile artistry that developed at the period. And we are very conscious that we always show, like any museum in the world, we always show our kimono on sort of T-shaped stands because that's really the best way to show the, the remarkable designs on kimono, but also to make sure that we don't damage the often fragile surfaces. But the disadvantage, particularly for audiences who are not so familiar with uh, kimono, is that people tend to think of them as two-dimensional works of art, not as clothes. And we really wanted people to um, understand that these are fashionable clothes. So where we could, we styled up our kimono on mannequins. And I think that made a real difference to people's perception 
of these garments and we were very much assisted by our wonderful uh, colleagues in the textile conservation studio to be able to uh, mount these. This display is of the formal dress worn by the samurai class of the military aristocracy of Japan during the Edo period, but it was really the um, merchant class who were at the sort of bottom of the social ladder who were the catalysts for uh, the great sort of uh, changes that took place in the Edo period. They were the ones who uh, had growing affluence and, and confidence and they were the ones who really wanted all the latest uh, kind of styles. And this display here just let it, was just one in which we showed how the pattern changes on kimono over a period of time. We also explored in the central section uh, the floating world of uh, the Kabuki theatre and the licensed uh, pleasure districts where again fashion really really flourished. As I said kimono often seen as very uh, particularly Japanese but we wanted to show how how what an important part they played in cultural exchange, even during the Edo period where Japan operated a closed country policy, which really se severely restricted its foreign relations. It did, however, allow the Dutch to trade in Japan. The Dutch brought with them uh, sort of exotic goods from other parts of the world, particularly from other parts of Asia, which they traded, including cotton cloth from um, India, which were made up into a stylish kimono. And the reverse side of the story is that the Dutch were given uh, kimono often as often sort of diplomatic gifts which they took back to the Netherlands caused an immense stir there, these beautifully soft, silk, colourful garments. And the Dutch started to commission from the Japanese slightly adapted kimono, which had more tubular sleeves rather than long hanging ones, and were thickly uh, wadded with beautiful sort of lightweight silk to make them particularly cosy in the environs of Northern Europe. In the late, in the 19th century, second half of the 19th century, Japan really opened itself up to uh, foreign trade. Uh, this led, led to a craze for all things Japanese across the world. Um, and kimono that came to London were often cleverly transformed in, into, into dress, but also there was a real vogue for wearing kimono, particularly amongst the sort of more sort of artistic, slightly like bohemian uh, sort of women of sort of literary and artistic society in, in London and other big cities. Japan responded um, to this desire for kimono by making specific kimono for foreigners, which is what you see on the slide um, on your right here. And these are often in shiny satin silk, very bold embroidery. And because the Japanese realized that uh, women in the West didn't understand how to tie an obi, they provided a sash in exactly the same kind of fabric. And this, what's interesting about this garment is that it has extra triangular panels in the back along the back seam, which allow it to drape more like a skirt so you can wear it over petticoats. And this dates to the early 20th century when there started to be a really radical, the radical influence of Japan on European clothing can be seen as designers started to abandon these sort of highly constructed, tightly corseted garments in favour of um, fabric that just loosely draped the body from the shoulders. And again, we explore that very much in the centre of the exhibition. In Japan itself, the kimono was still predominantly worn, although some Western fashions were worn, but it was a time when really new techniques and, and, and chemical dyes really opened up the colour palette and it led to the sort of great abundance of clothing that people could afford for the very first time that was sold, ready-made, off the peg in department stores. And we sort of show that in this wonderful mirrored room in the centre of the exhibition. After the war, kimono wearing in Japan dramatically declined and it became less an item of everyday dress or fashion and more a codified costume that was worn for special occasions such as coming of age or, or getting married. Efforts were made by the government to preserve kimono culture and the important techniques that were used, particularly through the system of assigning a skilled practitioners with the title Living National Treasure, like as Moraguchi Kunihiko here, and also smaller studios and individuals who've made sure that these kind of techniques that are used do not die out. In the West, our vision of uh, the kimono often comes through, is mediated through film, uh, particularly the samurai movies of um, Kira Kurosawa, which in turn very much influenced uh, George Lucas when he was creating the first Star Wars movie and in fact the the costume worn by the Jedi particularly by uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi played by of course by Alec Guinness were inspired particularly by Kimono and we borrowed these costumes from Lucas films. We also look at how performers often inspired by Japanese dress and the, how the continuing interest in Kimono 
has been an important influence on international fashion designers such as Jean-Paul Gaultier and Alexander McQueen, whose work you can see here. What's been happening in Japan recently is this revival of uh, kimono, where it looked like it might die out because kimono were very expensive and they're only worn for limited occasions. This really started on the street when people started to younger generations, perhaps didn't have the hang-ups of their parents or grandparents, started to restyle vintage kimono and wear them on the streets as partly as a reaction against the ubiquity of Western fast fashion, where every shop in the world sells exactly the same clothes. And this has really led to a resurgence in uh, the designing of kimono, new studios starting up, and a new, and a new wave of designers in, who approach the creation of kimono in very sort of fresh and unusual ways. And that's very much the last section of the exhibition where we combine the work of uh, kimono designers and other kinds of, of international designers in the, the last section, looking particularly at the way that kimono um, continues to flourish and to transcend uh, sort of cultural boundaries. And we also look at particularly at the growing interest in um, menswear uh, in Japan, wearing kimono, but also how the kimono has been styled up to be much more sort of for men as well, a much more sort of international style of dress that can be uh, part of anyone's uh, wardrobe. So from the sophisticated culture of 17th century Japan to the creativity of the contemporary catwalk, the kimono has been subject to both local and uh, international a reinvention while always retaining an essence of its Japanese-ness and that I think really gives, really gives it a very unique place in the history of fashion and that's very much what we celebrate in our exhibition. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, clue is in the title of the exhibition. Can you tell us briefly why Kyoto is central to the story of kimono? Well, Kyoto has always been the, at the heart of luxury production in Japan, particularly of kimono. And it was really in Kyoto in the um, mid 17th century that this new uh, spirit of, of stylish sophistication started to emerge. And although the focus then soon shifted, particularly um, as you go into the 18th and early 19th century towards Edo, the city we now call Tokyo, which was the capital of Japan, kimono was still made in Kyoto. So if you wanted to, you could go to a shop and buy just a roll of cloth and have it made up into your own home. But if you wanted to commission a beautiful silk kimono with wonderful dyeing or embroidery or whatever, your, your garment would be made in Kyoto. And even today, Kyoto is very important in the, in the sort of story of, of creation of kimono, because although kimono uh, are made in many parts of Japan now, I think Kyoto um, practitioners in Kyoto really can draw on this uh, sort of amazing heritage and many of the skilled practitioners, uh, the weavers and the dyers are still based in Kyoto, so it's still a very um, central, uh, at the heartland really, of kimono creation in Japan. And of course, Jotaro Saito's family come from Kyoto yes. Yes. and his work is on display in the exhibition. So can you tell us how you got to know him and a little bit about his work at the exhibition? Um, well, I first um, in the summer of 2017, I had a very brief visit to Tokyo where a friend of mine took me to Ginza 6, which was this great new sort of retail emporium right in the heart of Ginza, as you mentioned. And I was really thrilled to find a fashionable kimono designer in amongst all those European and American designers. And I realized I had kind of heard of Jotaro Saito. I'd read a few online articles. So as I started to um, work on the show in earnest in 2018, I felt he was obviously somebody I really needed to talk to because for, for us, he was really the Kyoto to catwalk story, if you like, you know. And so I was taken to uh, visit him first in January 2018 with Sheila Cliff, who was a great sort of promoter of kimono in Japan. And I just talked to him there about his practice and so on. And then as I went to Japan repeatedly, it was for uh, research for the exhibition, we went to visit him in his studio in Kyoto, talked about his work, talked about his possible involvement in the exhibition, and maybe I think it was just the idea that he 
because he because he sees himself not as a kimono designer as a fashion designer because he's he's a sort of inheritor of this sort of hokuture of kimono design although he makes more casual wear as well of course he seemed very much to be at the heart of the story i was trying to tell and in fact in october 2019 we went again to kyoto with our with some fashion journal journalists from britain and we visited Jotaro's studio there and he showed us the garment that he was creating just at that moment for the exhibition. So we have him right at the beginning of the exhibition. As I say, he kind of sums up everything we're doing and really at the end as well, because he wants really much to show that menswear has this wonderful revival going on at the moment. And Jotaro Saito is very, again, makes it uh, incredible kimono that for men or indeed for, for anyone, for unisex kind of garments. So um, he sort of bookends the exhibition, which we thought was rather nice. Very good, and we're joined by Saito-san right now. Um, Saito-san, can you tell us where you are at the moment? Ah, hi, konnichiwa. Boku wa desu ne, ima, Kyoto ni orimasu. Jibun no seisaku no kobo ni, soko kara, eh, to, remote de hanai sashi itadaitemasu. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I am connected from Kyoto and this is my studio's workshop and I am standing right there. So hello everyone. Thank you, Saito-san. What made you decide to cooperate with the V&A's exhibition? Hi, there are a lot of kimono in Japan, but first of all, I was excited to やっぱりその着物ファッションとして捉えてる展覧会っていうことですね。日本が今まで日本の博物館も今まで で、かつですね、え、着物も今なお、え、ファッションとして続く、え、着物のストーリーはまだ続いてるんだという過去のものではなくて、え、今新しいものとしての捉え方にとにかく僕は嬉しくて、excited しました。Um, yes. The reason why I was excited to be part of the exhibition is because um just to give you a bit of a context, there there are many kimono exhibitions in Japan as well. Um, many museums have attempted to showcase um, the kimono collections. However, the difference, a large difference is that they are more focused on traditions and history, whereas this exhibition at V&A is very much focused on kimono as fashion. And that's what really excited me. Um, it's because a lot of the traditional uh, museum collections in Japan showcased what was what was worn in the Momoyama period and what was the Junihitoe, the 12 layers of kimono was. but this V&A one is very much about what is kimono as fashion and really showcase the connection that is worn today, kimono as today, and that kimono is not in the history, but it is part of the ongoing trend and the story that is continuing now. Thank you. I've read that you designed Western um, attire earlier in your career. And I'd like to ask if you have anything from the West that has influenced you in your outlook. あの、ですから、あまりそのファッションとしてというよりかはきちっと着るということがえ、着物の目的になってたんですけども、えっと、そこがやっぱりファッションとして発信するとなると、やっぱりその、いかにその着る人の個性とか、え、どういったらいいかな、あ
um, in the order that has been set as well. But um, so that is definitely still um, the, in the style of contemporary kimono wearing as well. Um, but when I think about designing kimono as fashion, um, I do believe that individuality um, between everyone's personalities are important and also their individual fashion sense of the wearer um, should be valued as well. And that is something that I try and prioritize um, when, I do, when I design kimono. Thank you. Um, what we're seeing on screen now is um, ensembles, which was designed for the V&A's exhibition in 2009, but this year you released a collection called uh, Misty Empire, Kirino Teikoku. Can you just briefly give us what, um, a reason why you chose that name? Yes. At the beginning, Kirino Teikoku is a city that I thought was a city of the city, but I didn't see the city of the city. え、あの、when I first envisioned this misty empire concept, um, it was just a fantasy space, um, fantasy urban landscape that I had in my mind. Um, and I just imagined um, this urban scape is filled with um, very cool and collected handsome Japanese young women wearing kimono. Um, but as the design progress um, developed and also like and I started um, working with VNA, I really started to imagine misty empire as London actually, the scenes of London and this great city. So now when I think about that, I imagine London, um, this grayish town filled with Japanese handsome young women wearing kimono, that's, that's what I'd like to imagine. So yes, it is London in my mind. Perhaps some handsome Londoners wearing your kimono. Very good. Thank you. ありがとうございます。